morning's reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. A voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Word of God, word of life. I invite the children to come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody's tired today, huh? Me too. Anybody here in the reading, what happened to Jesus? Did you hear what happened to Jesus in our reading? Has something to do with this water. Water, yeah. Um, a baby blessing. Jesus, it's like a baby blessing. It's like us being baptized. Jesus was baptized in our lesson. He was baptized in a river. Isn't that interesting? Because that's how they did baptisms then. <laughs> Things were very different. Is that, is that river water? This isn't river water. No. No, I wasn't quite ambitious this morning. But, you know, this is just regular water, just like Jesus was baptized with, just like river water, but this came out of the faucet instead. So, how many of you, do any of you remember being baptized? No. I, I don't either. I was only like 10 days old. Any of you know, what is baptism? What? It's like you have to like put the baby's um, head in water. Yeah. Often it's a baby. And you hold the baby over the baptismal pond, and then you put water over the baby, or the child, or the adult. Did you know grown-ups can be baptized too? Yeah, sometimes grown-ups are baptized. Because Jesus was a grown-up when he was baptized too. So, what are some things that water does? What is water good for? Drinking. Drinking. What else? Bathing. Bathing. Yeah, exactly. It brings us life. Like, if we didn't have water, we wouldn't be able to keep living, right? It helps keep us clean. How many of you like to take a bath or a shower? Why, all of them. Take note of that, parents. No <laughs> arguing next time, right? So it, it helps us to stay clean. It gives us life. And that's really what baptism is all about, too. I'm wondering, will you come up with me to the baptismal font and maybe pour this water in there? Come up here. This is where we do baptisms, right? 
And so during that service, and some of you maybe can't see in there. Do you see there? Yeah. So we pour water in there to remind us that God created the heavens and the earth and the waters and the seas. And then when we do the baptism, we wash the person with that water. They don't get all clean because we don't put their whole body in there. But it, it cleans us kind of from the inside out. And it gives us life and shows us that God loves us and is going to be with us forever. And while we only get baptized one time, we can always remember our baptism. Like if you see water or if you're washing your face, you can stick your fingers in, you can stick your hands in if you want to. You can do that right now if you want. And when you were baptized, the pastor, for a lot of you, it was me, I made a cross on your forehead like that and said, Child of God, you are marked with the cross of Christ. And so that's something you can do. You can put your fingers in the water and you can make a cross on your forehead. Can you do that right now? It's a little cross. And that reminds you, very good, that reminds you that God loves you forever. That God claimed you. God said, you're my child. I love you so much. And I'm going to be with you forever. So every time you see water, you can remember your own baptism. And that God loves you just as God loved Jesus on the day of his baptism. So will you pray with me? Repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. And for loving him. And claiming him. Thank you for loving us and claiming us in baptism. Help us remember how much you love us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Over Christmas break, I saw an internet post that showed pictures of things that people had ordered online. They'd show what people expected that they were ordering, and then a picture of what it actually looked like. Have you ever seen these? Here are a few examples that maybe you can see up here. It's a beautiful rug for an apartment, right? But it helps to specify the size. <laughs> about this lovely cactus scratching post that I could buy for my new kitten? Pretty cool, right? But apparently it comes with um, some assembly required. <laughs> or these fantastic Apple AirPods that miraculously grow into shower sprayers in their time of shipping. This whole idea of getting something much different than what you expected to get oddly does kind of connect with our gospel reading today. But to get there, we need to do a little bit of a rewind to Elijah in the Old Testament. You might remember Elijah was a prophet who God sent to get Israel to repent of its evil ways and turn back to God. Elijah gave the people proof of God's power compared to the the gods that King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were worshiping. Elijah's life was tough, and he lived much of it in the wilderness with little to eat and no concern for his appearance, so he's always remembered as being pretty rugged and scraggly looking. When Elijah's time of prophesying was over, he handed on the baton to the prophet Elisha. At that point, most prophets would just fade out of attention or would die peacefully. But instead, we hear that Elijah didn't die. As he was talking with Elisha, a chariot of fire appeared in between them, and Elijah was swept up into heaven with a whirl, in a whirlwind, very much alive. Whoosh! Second best exit scene in the Bible. <laughs> After Jesus, of course. And because Elijah didn't die, there was this belief that Elijah would return someday, before the Messiah came. In fact, there's still a tradition for Jewish families who celebrate Passover to leave an extra place at the table and an extra glass of wine in case Elijah should return. It's based on the second last verse of the Old Testament from Malachi 4. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. 
And that's one of several verses that prophesy that a man will come to prepare the world for the Messiah. So after Elijah's dramatic departure from the earth, you can just imagine the dramatic spectacle of Elijah returning in a whirlwind, maybe with fiery chariots, chariots maybe wearing gold armor with a huge sword in his hand, in some powerful posture, ready to prepare the world for the Messiah by building armies and training soldiers for the Messiah to use in the battle against all of Israel's enemies. And it would make a great movie, wouldn't it? But instead of being reintroduced to Elijah through this biblical superhero scene with drama and power and majesty, Matthew's Gospel has a very different scene. Imagine a cameraman starting the cameras rolling to start catching the return of the mighty Elijah, but finding instead a skinny, scraggly-looking guy sporting a leather belt and camel's hair loincloth standing knee-deep in a river, shouting at people like a crazy person, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And I can just imagine the cameraman going, oh, that's clearly not Elijah. Let's cut and move along. We learn that this scraggly-looking man is named John, not Elijah. He's not building an army of soldiers. He's baptizing an army of followers who have recognized their sin and came to him to be symbolically washed clean. That's not what they expected Elijah to do for his people. And when some very important, very high-ranking Jewish authorities came to check out this maybe Messiah, this maybe Elijah, John looked straight at them, called them snakes, and told them that their ancestry, their pedigree, their power meant nothing to him. Through a pretty graphic metaphor about barren trees being thrown into the fire, John makes it clear that where people come from, or who their ancestors are, didn't matter a bit. What mattered was whether they bore fruit, whether they lived out their faith by confessing their sins, by changing their sinful ways, by serving and loving and showing mercy to others. John wasn't baptizing the rich and the powerful of Israel just so they could show off how righteous and powerful they were. He was baptizing people who realized their flaws and wanted a new beginning, regardless of their heritage or ancestry. What mattered wasn't their past. What mattered was how they would bear fruit, how they would live out their faith. And while John was not the Elijah people were expecting, John came to prepare the way for the Messiah, but in a different way than the prophets had expected. But then again, Jesus wasn't the Messiah that the people expected either. We've talked here about how the Jews of Jesus' time were expecting and hoping for a military messiah to defeat the power of Rome to give Israel back to the Israelites. They were not expecting the messiah to be born in a stable in the little town of Bethlehem, visited by backcountry shepherds and foreign stargazers who told his, his peasant parents that the king of the land was looking to kill him. They certainly weren't expecting that their young Messiah's family had to flee to Egypt to live as refugees until that king died. That's not the kind of Messiah they were expecting or hoping for. The Messiah they had ordered looked very much like this, not like this. The people never imagined that their Messiah, what their Messiah would do to kick off his reign that he would start his ministry by being baptized by a wacky prophet in a river. Yet that's exactly what today's gospel is about. Jesus came out to the wilderness and quietly stood in line with the other people, patiently waiting his turn to be baptized in the Jordan River like everybody else. But don't you wonder why? Why does that make any sense? John was baptizing sinners to prepare them for Jesus' coming. And here Jesus is standing in line to be baptized like the normal sinners. For what? Why would Jesus want to be baptized? 
How many of you, show of hands, went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison? How many of you have gone to sporting events at UW? Okay, so if you've done either one of those, you're inevitably, you've inevitably become familiar with a couple of songs on Wisconsin, of course, and also varsity, right? The alma mater song of the university. And why do you know those songs? It's because it's a part of the culture, the community of the University of Wisconsin. If you're a Badger, those songs are songs that unite you, right? It's kind of like a ritual, just like wearing red Badger apparel, jumping around. So new students at UW almost always buy Badger gear, and they learn the songs and the rituals because those things make them feel like they're part of the community. And I think that is the big reason that Jesus chose to be baptized. He didn't need to be baptized to be forgiven of his sins. He didn't need to be baptized to be prepared for his own coming, of course. I mean, Jesus was God. Baptism was unnecessary. But being baptized was a meaningful ritual of new beginnings for Jesus' people. Being baptized united Jesus with the people that he came to save. Jesus came not just to watch humans do human things like God had throughout all of history. Jesus came to become human, to experience firsthand the things that humans do, to truly walk with us, knowing what we go through. For the people who went to John at the River Jordan, baptism symbolized a new beginning. And as Jesus came up out of that same water, it became a new beginning for him as well. Not a forgiveness of sins, but the heavens opened. The Spirit descended upon him like a dove, and God declared that Jesus was his beloved Son. This moment in the ritual that signified a new beginning for God's people also became a new beginning for Jesus and his ministry. But after Jesus was baptized to unite him with his people, after he lived a life to save his people, Jesus also added new meaning to baptism. Where baptism had originally been a symbolic ritual of forgiveness and new beginnings that people could go through over and over, baptism became much more. As God claimed Jesus as his beloved son in baptism, baptism is the way that God claims us as his beloved children. Baptism also washes away our sins. It unites us in Christian community. And baptism promises us not just a new beginning in this life, but in the next life as well. John wasn't the Elijah figure that people had expected, and Jesus wasn't the Messiah that the people expected either. It turns out that defeating Rome wasn't the most important thing that God could do, or the most necessary thing for God's people. As John baptized Jesus on that day, God made it clear that he was doing things differently than anybody would expect. God sent his own son to walk among us, not just to save Israel, but to save the entire world, to claim us as his beloved children in baptism, and to forever become part of our community on earth so that we can become part of God's community in heaven. Through Jesus' life, through his ministry, God showed that he was all about doing more amazing things than people could ever expect or hope for. And we can thank God for that. Amen. Our hymn of the day is.